second, just one second, look at another table. And uh, if you know somebody's name at the other table, yell out their name and say, Bob, you're going to Rome. Okay, one, two, three. So my desire, my desire, my desire is twofold. If I was to stop right now and this retreat would conclude right now, my desire would be twofold. One is short term, one is long term. Short term is that for the rest of our time, when you meet people in the hallway, in the restroom, at the lunch table, wherever you might be, in the hotel, in the elevator, you don't have to know them. Just look at them and say, you're going to Rome. <laughs> Let that be your benediction in somebody's life. Today and tomorrow. My long-term hope is that you will write that, type that, laminate it, put it all over the place. Simply needs, needs to say what? All it needs to say is what? I'm going to Rome. Well, how many of you know that there will be those distractions and disappointments in life? When you're shipwrecked, you don't know if you're going to Rome. When you are stranded on the island of Melita, you don't know if you're going to Rome. When snakes are biting you, you don't know if you're going to Rome. When your feet are shackled and your hands are in chains, you don't know if you're going to Rome. Especially when it uh, is in such dichotomy to what you thought it was going to be. <laughs> I'm coming to you with joy <laughs> by the will of God. And you wake up Sunday morning and you don't want to go to church. And you're the preacher. I've been there. I woke up many Sunday mornings saying, God, wish I was sick. <laughs> not too sick, not too sick, but <laughs> sick enough to call somebody and say, hey, man, I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> Can you do something this morning? There were times I didn't want to go to church because my wife Brenda and I were fighting. I don't know about you, but when I was pastoring, the biggest fights we ever had were on Sunday mornings. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Oh, there's nothing worse. So, so in my church, in my church, we used to have those three chairs. You remember the three chairs? The Pope's chair in the middle, the high one, and the other two for the two flunkies. <laughs> I've sat in both chairs. I've sat in the flunky chair saying, one day... And then I sat in the big chair saying, hey, you. And there's nothing worse than sitting in the, my wife would always sit on the third row there. I don't know. You know, there's special Sunday morning demons. You know that. They, they, they start brushing their teeth in hell on Saturday night. They're on their way to your, to your house Sunday morning. Now, some of you are looking at me like, we never go through that. So if you want to lie to yourself, be, <laughs> be self-delusional. But... Uh, I remember sitting there in that, in that, you know, in the high chair, and there she is, and you know how your wives do. And I know I got to preach in a little bit, you know. I mean, it's like, oh, Holy Spirit, oh, Lord, how can I get up there? And so I'm going through all this angst sitting over there, and, uh, you know, I'm saying to her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No grace, no mercy. It's like, stew, stew, baby, stew. I'm blowing her kisses. No response. I finally have to get up there and do something, right? And I know what she's thinking. If these people knew what I know, when I give the altar call, I know what she's thinking. You jerk. <laughs> you need to be the first one down there. And when you're having those days and you're having those weeks and sometimes it's cases months and I get to talk to pastors who have years of that, uh, you've got to remind yourself, I'm going to Rome. You've got to know that. You've got to know, regardless of what you see, what you don't see, what happens, what does not happen, who supports you and who leaves you. Who says good things about you. Who says bad things about you. Who gives and who does not give. Regardless of the environment. Regardless of the 
data around you. You've got to remind yourself, one, two, three, I'm going to row. row. And whatever your Rome is, God's promised you that. And he's a faithful God. And, he's a faith and the question he'll ask is, I gave you a promise of Rome. Were you faithful going toward Rome? So, as we fellowship for the rest of the day and a half that we have over here, let's look at somebody. Now, you may be with somebody in the elevator. They may not be part of our group. Just tell them you're going to Rome. They might think you're offering them a cruise or something, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, look, look at the people in the, in the hotel, you know. Just, just look at them, tell them you're going to Rome. You never know what might be going on. And sure enough, just get yourself a little three by five here and there, stick it in your truck, put it in your mirror. Uh, I have those kind of things all over my place and uh, just remind myself I'm going to Rome, I'm going to Rome. I thought since I'm in Nebraska, uh, you might get a kick out of this. So I was supposed to be with uh, Pastor Rick at Christ's place uh, this weekend for the Saturday service and Sunday. And uh, we started getting news in Atlanta that uh, that's where I live, in Atlanta, that we're going to get snow. One inch of snow. And schools were shutting down, business shutting, shutting down. I knew airports would be shut down. Atlanta is the world's busiest airport. It was gonna sh I knew it was going to shut down. So we were predicted with one inch of snow. I'm going to show you the headlines of the Atlanta newspaper. One inch of snow. Now, you Nebraska folk, this is, I'm, I'm making fun of myself. This is what the headline says. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so before I went to Atlanta, I was a pastor of a church in uh, Michigan, Michigan, on the other side of Lake Michigan, exactly 150 miles east of Chicago. So I had never lived in snow before. I was a youth pastor in Portland, Oregon before that. In those days, youth pastors basically were your glorified gophers. In some places, they still are, but in those days especially. <laughs> Do I hear an amen in this room? Mm -hmm. So, uh, moved to Michigan. We were in a snow belt. I didn't, I heard, you know, your vocabulary changes. Snow belt, uh, lake effect. And so three miles this way, they could get six, eight inches. Three miles this way, they would get six, and eight inches. We would get 12, 15, 18 inches. Uh, our parking lot, we'd have to bring in front-end loaders and trucks to haul snow away. And yet those were some days. But a little bit about my church, where I learned almost all the lessons that I teach today. Country church. Uh, let me define country for you. Because some of you are saying, what does he know about country? I probably don't because you can up my story, I know that. But here's my story. The closest blinking light to us was three and a half miles. The closest McDonald's was 18 miles. Uh, my closest neighbor was a quarter mile, so when my wife was beating me up, there was nobody to hear me. <laughs> Farming community, the largest Sunday, I, I was there for nine years, the largest uh, Sunday I ever had, as amazing as I am. <laughs> yeah. The largest, yeah. Uh, that's the delusion. That's, it just depends on what you're smoking, you know. So uh, the, the largest Sunday I ever had was 150 when we offered food. <laughs> uh, my first service, there were 13 of us, me and my wife, and she was carrying our first baby at that time. So there were two and a half right there. And then there were 11 and a half other folk. <laughs> uh, farming community. I, I still remember, I still remember uh, Deacon Boland. 
Uh, so, so, so this is this is the this is the the, the old, old church. So, so if this is the church, the parking lot is right there. The street is right there. You know, the the parsonage was attached to the parking lot to the church. So, if this is the church, uh, that is the baptistry. You remember the old baptistry? And uh, if you poked a hole through the baptistry, you'd be in my living room. <laughs> and because the parsonage, the church folk thought they owned it. They all had keys to it. They would actually come into our home and go into our refrigerator. Yeah, I got stories to tell. Uh, and and uh, I remember uh, Deacon Bolan. I don't know why I'm even telling this story. It had nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about, but that's okay. Uh, I went to Bible college, and there was a special class called How to Ramble. So that's what I'm doing. So. I'm a professional rambler, you know. <laughs> yeah, you get paid. Don't try this at home. You got to go to college to learn how to ramble. So, uh, uh, so Deacon Boland says to me, he said, uh, Brother Sam, I went by the church, which meant my house. Uh, it's all coded language. Uh, I went by the church the other morning. I didn't see your light on. I said, what time did you go by? He said, oh, somewhere between 4, 35 o'clock. Now, you know, he's going to do his job, 4, 35. But I heard what he was saying. Can somebody tell, whoever got the gift of discernment, tell me what is he trying to tell me? <laughs> I had no intention of getting up at 4.30. So thank God for Radio Shack. <laughs> Went to Radio Shack, got me one of those timer extension things, put a lamp in the window <laughs> for 4.15, 4.15. He went by, saw the light on. Next Sunday, he says to me, Brother Sam, I saw your light on. I said, yeah, praise the Lord, God's good. It is there that I learned. It is there that I learned. And I continue to learn that numbers change, but issues remain the same. Numbers change, but issues remain the same. I could come to your church, and you may have 15 on a Sunday morning. And in 10 days' time, I'll be sitting down with a pastor in Manila with 300,000 with 30, 300, people. And the conversation is going to be the same. So there are churches that say, you know, if I had 200 people, I would not have to deal with this. No. You'll always deal with demons. You'll always deal with devils. Your church will never grow as fast as you think it ought to grow. Your church will never be organized for the next stage. Your bylaws are always going to be suffocating. Reality never changes. So I want to encourage every one of you, if you're looking for utopia, it's not going to happen on this planet. So you do need to write this down. Numbers change. But issues remain the same. Issues remain the same on the, not just about church, but about you. All of us want to be loved. Is that not true? All of us want to be accepted. All of us want people to think we're all that in a bag of chips. All of us want people to accept us. All of us want people to honor us. All of us want people who will want us for who we are, not just what we can do for them. All of us have those, those innate desires that come. And, and doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how, how big your church is or how small your church is, it has nothing to do with who you are. So if your identity gets wrapped up in the size of your church, it will jerk you around forever. If your identity is wrapped up in how many you have Sunday morning, <laughs> then you're going to either feel really good or really bad. I mean, think about, think about the Sunday after Easter. 
I mean, that's the Sunday you ought to be on vacation. Because everybody came to church on Easter and everybody stayed away the Sunday after. It's a high and comparatively a, a low. What I'm saying to you is, God called you for where you are because Father knows best. And don't wrap up your identity with... Uh, With stuff that you can count. Because can I tell you something? There's always somebody with a bigger church. Somebody who can jump faster, has got more lights and smoke coming out. Somebody, yeah, sounds, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't have service without that anymore. So, uh, you know, there's always somebody who's got a better keyboard. Uh, there's always somebody who's got electric drums, you know. Uh, the, yeah, the... What is that? So anyway, so, so uh, you, you, there's always somebody who can preach better than you. There's always, I mean, you're always going to deal with somebody else. And, and I, I, can, I, can I just talk to you? Listen, this, can I just tell you what I'm going to do for the next four sessions especially? This morning, the next session will, it will end in uh, hmm, 26 minutes. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm going by the paper. You told me 10.30, I'm going to quit at 10.30. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Pastor uh, Bob Wine said to me, one thing you need to know about our district, we don't pay overtime. <laughs> so I'm just going by what he told me. <laughs> Why do I want to work more if I'm going to get paid, right? I will get paid for this, right? <laughs> I am an Indian, you know, after, after a while you got to work things out here. There are some things you work out publicly, like over here, can't you talk to him? <laughs> but you've been talking for a long time, it hasn't happened, you know, so. If you, if you don't com get comfortable in your own skin, there's always somebody who's going to make you feel you're not all that. I have those moments all the time. Uh, with what I'm doing right now, what God's called me to do, uh, I get to be with the who's who of the church world uh, on the same platforms. Uh, you know, uh, I was doing a conference for Bishop Jakes in Orlando, and there are thousands of people there, and Bishop Jakes was in introducing me, and, you know, his introduction is, mm, somebody needs to know, mm, so, so, you know, so he's, he's got, I mean, he is working up a ladder, his sweat is coming out, he's got a towel on his head, you know. So he's walking around, that's the introduction, and then he says, and everybody put your hands together for my friend, Dr. Samuel Chan. And then I get up and do my stick, right? This is what I do. If you're not careful, you want to find where he left off. And look stupid. Uh, I, I remember uh, uh, last January I was back in Manila and I was doing a conference. And uh, any one of you heard of Ravi Zacharias? Yeah, yeah, yeah see? Uh, yeah. I mean, that was a, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant guy. So they invited two Indians to speak at this conference. <laughs> So Ravi is in my town, he's my friend, and uh, now here was the difference. Ravi had been there 30 times to this conference. And we had like 9,000 people from 26 countries, and, and uh, it was my first time there. So they did not know me. So Ravi's doing the first session, and I'm right after him without a break. Feeling my pain, are you? So I'm sitting on the front row, my wife is with me, and uh, sitting on the front row, and Ravi is, and Ravi is being deep, and he's, he's making up words as he goes along, and <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what Ravi does, I mean, it, it, so, but it's, it's, it's like, like, yeah, I don't know what it means, but boy, yeah, right, I agree with that. So, so he's got these people in the palm of his hand, I mean, he is, he's got PowerPoints, I never use PowerPoints because your points have to have power, and my, so, uh, <laughs> So, 
so, so he's got PowerPoints, he's got videos. I mean, he, I mean, he is being Ravi and he's apologist. And, and I'm sitting on the front row. He's doing so good. I'm thinking, God, let him fail. Let him do really bad. <laughs> so so I, 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 I say to my wife, Brenda, I said, Brenda, I'm nervous. She said, she said instead, of, I was expecting her to say, hey, you're going to be great. She said, you'll be all right. So, so Ravi does his thing, and it is, I mean, he has left those people cerebral. I mean, they are thinking at a higher level than they've ever thought before. They are writing notes as fast as they can. I mean, all that's going on. And then I get introduced. No break. I get, so Ravi is walking off. I'm walking on. We high-five each other. I don't know where to go with it. I mean, it's like, so for the next 10 minutes, I roasted Ravi. Nobody had ever done that before. <laughs> I wrote out words on a, on a flip chart like that that he had said and misspelled every one of them. I said, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so, so, you know, I just, just did 10 minutes of just roast Ravi. I look back over that time. <laughs> it was stupid, but I look back over that time. And to be honest with you, it was like, I have nothing to offer. And I say that to you to say that there's always somebody who's more brilliant than you. Somebody who can exegete the text in ways that you have never even dreamed about. Somebody who's got a vocabulary Somebody's got stage presence. Somebody's got charisma. Somebody's, somebody who's going to do better than you. There's always going to be that person who's going to do it better than you. And that is why just be who you are. You were placed on this planet to be an original. Why do you want to die a copy? You have a voice. Don't be an echo. you got to... I, at this point in my life, I probably believe the doctrine of the sovereignty of God more than ever in my life. There's a sovereign God who brought me to Kearney, Nebraska. There's a sovereign God who has placed me to do what I do. There's a sovereign God who's wired me. I mean, I'm stupid, I know that. My wife tells me, don't say that. That's not, that's not sophisticated. I said, babe, they don't call me because I'm sophisticated. <laughs> but this is who I am. This is what I do. And I wish I could tell you that I am there. But I must confess to you, I struggle with that all the time. Especially when I'm talking to pastors. Because pastors are my heroes. The hardest job on this planet, the second hardest job is being a pastor. The hardest job is being married to a pastor. And ladies here, time to say amen or something like that. So I'm going to say that sentence again. Wake up, wake up, wake up over here. I'm going to say that sentence again. Come on, go ahead, tune up now. I need some... Soprano, some alto, some ten, I, 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 I need some, okay, so the, the second hardest job is being a pastor. But the hardest job is being married to a pastor. Uh -huh. Because as a pastor, as a professional, you see more of the wear and tear of life than any other professional. A doctor sees you for, uh, for physical needs, an attorney sees you for legal needs, your insurance agent sees you for insurance needs. Your banker sees you for financial needs. The psychiatrist sees you because you're crazy. But as a pastor, as a pastor, you see more of the wear and tear of life than any other professional. You see people from the womb to the tomb. A friend of mine says you hatch, match, and dispatch. <laughs> I wish there was the original with me, but... You see people when they're up, you see people when they're down. 
You see people when they're getting married. You see people when they are getting divorced. You see people when they move into a new house. You see people when they're being evicted. You see people when they got a new job. They see people. You see people when they are fired. You see people when their babies are being born. You see people when the mama is dying. You see them when they're up, they're down, the high, the low. You see them at every moment of their life. And those are what are called body blows. And you live in an environment of body blows on a constant level. On a constant level. On a constant level. And after a while, it starts taking its toll on you. And that is where you've got to believe two things. I'm going to... And in the ultimate doctrine of the sovereignty of God. You've got to believe that God knows who I am. God knows where I am. God knows where I am going. God knows the end from the beginning. God's got me. you got to believe that. Because once you believe in the sovereignty of God, then you know he's got you. It doesn't matter where you might be in your life. So last night I uh, talked to you about when God says I'm doing a new thing, it's not a new thing. It's about how we think about what we are about to do. So let me draw something up here and uh, see if you can tell me what this is. I don't know if you all can see it or not, but anyways, here we are. And here we are. Can somebody tell me what that is? Okay, obviously all are geographically challenged. <laughs> this is North America. <laughs> and this is South America. <laughs> I had higher expectations from you all. I must need to know, I need for you to know I'm deeply disappointed. <laughs> So, I had the opportunity to go to the country of Panama a few years ago. And the pa Panama is known for what? Panama Canal. Anybody in here been to the Panama Canal? Okay. One hand? Okay. Two hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that hand. I see that hand. So, <laughs> going to turn this into an altar call right here. We usually end up counting more hands than they're really up. So, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. This stuff, just, this stuff just comes to me in the moment, you know. I mean, I, you can't make up this stuff. So, uh, somebody asked me at breakfast table, where do you get those jokes from? I said, I'm stupid. So, uh, <laughs> so, I'm standing here at the Panama Canal, and I notice, I notice, that they are doing some construction. They are widening the canal. Can someone tell me why they were widening the canal? Say again. Ships are bigger? Absolutely. And they need more ships. Why do they need more ships? Uh, just as trivia for, so, so here's the, for you geographic people, Here's the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Here's the Atlantic Ocean. Somebody needs to take a picture of this. <laughs> Your grandkid will know more about this than you. So, and there are dozens, <laughs> dozens of ships over here, dozens of ships over here waiting to go through. This was trivia. This canal was built in 1913. And to go through, it cost them $750,000. That's toll. Sounds like a lot of money, right? Until you realize that if the same ship had to go around, it'll take $5 million. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, $750,000 is a chunk of change, right? It's like, yeah, I'll pay that. So in 1913, they built the canal for the larger ships. But now there are cities that float. 
And as I was standing there, it occurred to me, it occurred to me, that that is how our churches are. We built them in, back then, for the biggest vision we had. But how many of you know God is doing bigger things now? In deeper ways. There are more opportunities to serve now than ever before. So my question for you this morning is, what do you need to do to widen your canal? What do you need to do to widen your canal? So I'm going to give you a sentence to write down. And then I'm going to build on that for the next three sessions. Here's a sentence. Your size and your speed. Your size and your speed. Your size and your speed. is controlled by your systems and structure. Your size and your speed is controlled by your systems and structure. And because that's the sentence I'm going to build on for the next... Uh, 18 hours? Let me make sure that you got it. One, two, three. That's it. So size means bigger. Speed means faster. If you want to be bigger and faster, it's controlled by your systems, which is your people, and your structure, which are your processes. So when I get called into an organization to consult with them, can I just tell you God has a weird sense of humor? So the largest Sunday I ever had was homecoming Sunday with food. Uh, by the way, if you have homecoming, just stop doing those. Because on homecoming, people who left your church come back for food. They left your church. Let them go. Why are you feeding these people? Because some of them like skunks. You can run them over, but you know they've been there. There are folk in your church who left your church three years ago, but you can still smell them. To stop inviting those people back. I mean, why? You don't like them anyhow. So why do you have to lie to them? Good to see you. You're not good to see you. Stay away. Anyways, I digress. So, uh, when I get invited into a church or an organization, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, a, like, a, like a doctor who uh, has to take vitals, has to take vitals. If you were to go into a doctor's office with a broken arm, it's dangling, right? It's a broken arm. The doctor is still going to take your blood pressure. Is that not true? They're still going to take your temperature. And if they don't like you, they'll take your weight. And your arm is dangling. And you say, Doc, it's not my BP. It's not my temperature, it's not my weight, it's my arm. <laughs> Fix it. <laughs> but the doctor's still going to take their vitals, right? So when I get called into an organization, I have some vitals too. And the first vital that I start with is what are their structures? Is their canal big enough to accommodate What's going to go through there? Okay. I'm going to draw another picture up here. I'm going to give you a second chance. <laughs> if you don't get this, you can go home now. Now that I know who I'm talking to, I'll bring the level of... <laughs> you know, you always adjust. 
Remember, I talked about the lowest common denominator. I know who I'm talking to, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So let's see if uh, I tell you what I'm going to do so that I don't run into that. Yeah, for you. So let's see if I can draw this. I know you're kind of shy right now. <laughs> you don't want to speak up too fast. What is that? Train. Good job. Train, yeah. One person says train and everyone says, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> a bunch of echoes in the room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's train. Yeah, yeah, that. Of course it is train. Yeah, you're just like your church folk. And a train runs on what? tracks. Question. Can you run a bigger, faster train on old tracks? Okay, second question. If the answer is no, which I agree with, by the way, if the answer is no, what would happen if you ran a bigger, faster train on old tracks? The train would what? Derail. My dear friends, this, the train, is your vision. We want to be bigger, faster. But the speed of the train is not controlled by the engine, you. The length and the bigness of the train is not determined by you. The speed of the train and the size of the train is determined by what? The tracks, which is your systems and your structure. So this is what happens. You read a book. You go to a conference, you watch YouTube, you listen to TED Talks, you get all excited, and you take that, and you create something, and you go to your folk, and you try to get the bigger, faster train going down the track. But if you don't lay down Yeah, thank you, sir. I'm waiting for somebody to get it. If you don't lay down, if you don't lay down new tracks, you can leave this retreat with amazing stuff. It's not going to happen. It's like culture. If you don't create the right culture, it's not going to happen. Uh, let, me, let me push my point there. All I'm doing right now is creating my introduction for the next three sessions. You go to a restaurant and you order a steak or salmon, whatever you want to order. And this is the plate. This, this is the steak. This is the steak. This is the plate. And they bring you the steak on the plate. And you notice somebody forgot to wash the plate. Are you going to eat that steak? Anything wrong with the steak? Anything wrong with the steak? No. It is just that the plate hadn't been prepared for the steak. The steak is the main event. This is just a delivery system. But this controls this. Uh, you need a kidney. You need a kidney. A uh, kidney transplant. And I give you a kidney. You know, you always give. You don't loan kidneys. So uh, it's not like as long as you're my friend, you can have my kidney. 
I might do a recall on that. I give you a kidney. If your body is healthy, it's going to receive the kidney. It's a perfect match, it's going to receive the kidney. But if your body is diseased, if your body is infected, what's going to happen to that good kidney? It's going to get rejected, right? And so I just want you to know your best plans when they don't work are because you did not do the dirty work. This is sexy. Is that okay to say not? <laughs> We're talking about wine and sex. <laughs> I'll go away tomorrow so you all can go back to normal, but till then. <laughs> yeah, why not? So, just push the envelope and worse will happen, you won't invite me back. I'll force myself back. I'll just show up. So, <laughs> this is what we call vision casting. I'm going, you have PowerPoints, you have handouts, you have pictures, you have videos. I mean, you are just, yeah. God spoke to me. You know, always throw the God card down. This. And we spend all our time in what? This. I'm saying to you, you can have the best train, but most people don't like doing the dirty work, the hard work, the back-breaking work of creating new or reinforced tracks. This is dirty work, but if you don't do this, this won't happen. Everyone good with that? All right, so before I give you a break, uh, I'm going to sell you some books in a minute. Uh, I mean, you want me to say something like, well, as God spoke to me, I have this for you. No, I got to make some money here, so... Uh, 